Good evening. My name is Lynn Thomas, and it's my great pleasure as Chair of the Department of History at the University of Washington to welcome you to our 2013 History Lecture Series. Thank you so much for attending. I would also like to welcome those watching the subsequent broadcast on UWTV. We're very excited to share this lecture with you. I am delighted that so many people will get a chance to hear Professor Sandra Joshel, one of our truly outstanding history faculty members. And I'm especially pleased to see so many history alumni and supporters here tonight. Welcome to all of you. This year's history lecture series on slavery and freedom and the making of America showcases the extraordinary expertise that our department possesses in the field of slavery and emancipation studies. Tonight and over the next three Wednesdays, you will hear lectures by some of the foremost experts in the world on the history of slavery and freedom. I'm very proud to say that all four of those experts, Professors um, Sandra Joshel, Stephanie Smallwood, Stephanie Camp, and Moon Ho Jung are all faculty members at the University of Washington. We chose this topic for this year because 2013 marks the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and declared free all enslaved people living in the southern states that were then at war with the Union. In so doing, Lincoln made their freedom an explicit goal of the Union war effort. Through this lecture series, we'll explore the complicated histories of slavery and freedom that gave rise to that pivotal moment in 1863, as well as the complicated histories of slavery and freedom that have flown, um, or flowed out from that moment. So a few words about the format of our lectures. Um, each lecture will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, um, and then we'll take a break. During that break, you're free to stretch your legs um, or visit the restrooms. After the break, the lecture will, will resume um, and speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll move directly into a question and answer session. Um, and we have uh, two microphones, or at least one microphone positioned in the aisle um, on the left, and we'd invite you to ask your question at the microphone um, so that everyone can hear. So before introducing tonight's lecture, I'd like to say a thank you to a number of people with whom this series would not be possible. My first debt of gratitude is to the five fantastic staff members in the Department of History who have worked tirelessly over months to pull this series together. These staff are Matt Erickson, Brendan Lee, Wanjiko Gitahi, Jerry Park, and Bryce Barrick. Um, I would also like to thank the other terrific history staff members who are helping out tonight, Lori Anthony, Kim McCraig, and Sarah Early. For first having the idea for a lecture series on this topic, I want to thank Divisional Dean Judy Howard. So she had this idea a number of years ago, um, and it's come to fruition tonight. I also want to thank UWTV for partnering with us to record and broadcast the series. Um, for financial support for the series and for the UWTV broadcast, I'm grateful to the Logan Family Endowment, established by Don Logan, who was a passionate student and teacher of the Civil War. For additional support, I want to thank the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies at the University of Washington, as well as Vice President for Minority Affairs and Vice Provost for Diversity, Sheila Edwards Lang, and Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, Luis Fraga. Please join me in giving all of them a round of applause. I'll ask now that if you haven't turned off your cell phones, you do so, um, so that we can proceed without interruptions. So tonight's lecturer, Professor Sandra Joshel, is a truly accomplished teacher and scholar of ancient Rome, of slavery, and of gender. She's an outstanding mentor to our graduate students, and in recognition of her excellent undergraduate teaching, she recently held the John Bridgman Professorship in History. 
Professor Doshel has held fellowships from Fulbright, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Council of Learned Societies. She's authored three books, co-edited two volumes, and penned numerous articles. Her latest book, co-authored with Lauren Peterson, is forthcoming with Cambridge University Press and is entitled The Material Life of Slaves. I was fortunate enough last spring to read parts of the manuscript, and I can testify that it's a truly magnificent accomplishment. The book draws together a wide range of textual and archaeological sources to do the very, very difficult job of reconstructing what the lives of slaves looked like from the ground up. We thought it was appropriate to commence this lecture series in ancient Rome because American slaveholders so often evoked the Roman Empire as the kind of slaveholding civilization that they sought to emulate. Tonight, Professor Joshua will answer two main questions. First, how did ancient Romans themselves conceive and institutionalize slavery? And second, how did their understandings of freedom hinge on the development of a slave system? So please join me in welcoming Professor Sandra Joshel to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I, I think there's one more person before I begin that should be thanked, and she can't really thank herself, but I would like to thank the chair of our department, Lynn Thomas, for shepherding this, <laughs> guiding this, and encouraging everyone. I, I think myself that it seems a bit odd to begin a lecture series entitled Slavery and Freedom in the Making of America with Ancient Rome. Yet in fact, as Lynn suggested, to many white men living in the United States in the 18th through the mid 19th century, such a beginning would have seemed perfectly normal. Indeed, to some, it, it would have seemed exactly correct. We should remember that until well into the 19th century, an education based on the study of Greek and Latin language and literature shaped the mentality of educated men and women in the United States. The result was an extensive process of naming and claiming what Stanley Bernstein called, Bernstein called a culture saturated in classical references. American political structures borrowed from Republican Rome. We have a Senate. Well, we have a Senate. We have a president. We have a capital, American cities borrowed from ancient geography. So there is an American Rome, an Athens, a Carthage, a Sparta, a Corinth, an Alexandria, and a half a dozen other uh, cities. I gotta get my magic thing out. Yes. Slaveholders too participated in this naming and claiming. Frequently they gave their slaves the names of ancient Roman and Greek gods, heroes, and politicians. So here is a Jupiter from 1770, a Cato from the 1820s, a Caesar from the 1820s, and a Pompey from the 1820s. All of these are advertisements for runaway slaves, for fugitives. Perhaps even more significant than this naming and claiming is that Greece and Rome provided a useful, mutable, and malleable past for making sense of the present. At different points in American history, both the educated classes and the popular classes identified with different great Roman men and, and, and women. Rather than run through a long catalog of Romans and the Americans who loved them, let me begin with the sort of iconic American, he's the guy in the middle, George Washington and his two favorite Romans, Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus and Marcus Porcius Cato. Now, so this is my frame, Cincinnatus at the beginning and Cato at the end. <laughs> 
On the screen is a sculptor's model of Antonio Canova's George Washington, just in case you didn't know. The statue was commissioned in 1815 by the Senate and House of Commons of the state of North Carolina, and it was installed in the State House in 1821 and then destroyed by fire uh, 10 years later, hence the use of the sculptor's model instead of the statue itself. On the advice of various worthies, including Thomas Jefferson, George Washington was garbed in the outfit of a Roman general and represented in the act of writing his farewell address. It, you wouldn't know, but it says to the citizens and people of the United States, in Italian, that is, because it's the sculptor's model. A general in military dress, in Roman military dress, and a politician resigning power evoked the very famous Roman statesman, Cincinnatus. Uh, this is uh, Cincinnatus in, I bet you can't guess, Cincinnati. <laughs> According to Roman history and Roman legend, in 458, Cincinnatus was the hero of the day. Rome's enemies threatened to destroy the army, and an embassy of senators sought out Cincinnatus, who, of course, was working on his four-acre farm, you know, just out there in the fields. They told him to clean up, put on his toga, and they announced that he had been made dictator. A dictator was an office of enormous power that was held for six months with the intent of solving some sort of crisis. This was Cincinnati. He left his farm, he defeated Rome's enemies, he resigned his office, and he returned to his plow all in 15 days. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a miracle these days, huh? In 439, Cincinnati again was made dictator, this time to save the Republic from a man who planned to make himself king. And again, he solved the problem in short order, gave up the dictatorship, gave up power, and of course went back to his plow. It's not surprising then that Roman moralists and orators adduced Cincinnati as the model of the dutiful Roman who served the Republic but sought no personal power. Washington, too, was the master of the noble resignation of power. He voluntarily gave up his command of the army at the end of the Revolutionary War and returned to his farm, that small place called Mont Vernon. He repeated the performance in 1797 by refusing a third term as president, and he consciously modeled his behavior on Cincinnati's his public behavior. And, and this is how he was perceived. Here is one of the eulogies penned at his death in 1800. After eight years faithful and gratuitous service at the head of our victorious armies, he cheerfully sacrificed upon the altar, the, the caps are in the quotation itself, upon the altar of his grateful country, the mighty harvest of laurels he had won. And Gray, like Cincinnati, returned to the plow, to the exercise of his domestic virtues, and the ever favorite object of his heart, the cultivation of the soft arts of peace. Washington, of course, did not exercise his domestic virtues on any four-acre farm, but rather on a large plantation staffed by many slaves. In fact, we should note that in Washington's case, as in the case of any planter, as in the case of any planter, the exercise of domestic virtues meant the practices of mastery over slaves who actually did the labor. Indeed, for the political elite of the slave-holding state of North Carolina who commissioned the statue, the statue was just not a memorial to a dutiful patriot and a disinterested statesman. It was also a marble embodiment of their own right to rule. Washington, in the words of one historian, was a public symbol of planter aristocratic rule by the political elite of a slave-holding state. For this elite, for these Republicans, for these slaveholders, there was, in fact, for them, 
no contradiction between their Republican causes and owning slaves. In fact, Southern defenders of slavery associated one with the other, Republican causes and the ownership of slaves. James Henry Hammond, one time governor and senator from South Carolina, for example, claimed, and these are his words, that slavery is truly the cornerstone and foundation of every well-designed and durable Republican edifice. And he and his fellow pro-slavery writers fished in the waters of ancient history, fished to find evidence of the ubiquity of slavery and its role as a basic building block of civilized life. The words are Hammond's. Well, I'm going to go fishing too. I intend to fish in the waters of ancient history, but to somewhat different, to very different purposes. I want to talk about Roman slavery and freedom to raise questions about slavery and freedom in the making of America. As I talk about Roman slavery, please remember several very basic historical conditions. These are um, uh, on top of a, a slave stock. The slaves would put their ankles in these holes and be pinned down. I thought it was an appropriate background. First, there was in ancient Rome and in the world of ancient Rome no free zone. There was no free north as there was in the United States after the beginning of the 19th century. There was in the ancient world no outside to slavery. Roman slaves existed in a world where everyone else had slaves. Two, there was no public movement like abolitionism which campaigned against slavery and defined it as wrong. Nobody defined slavery as wrong. Three, no one ever thought to abolish the slave trade as in the United States in 1808. And last but not least, and most ironically for this lecture series, there was nothing remotely like the Emancipation Proclamation. Sl Roman slaveholders manumitted slaves. They freed actually many slaves, but they freed them one by one. Any politician who proposed to free a group of slaves was considered by virtually everybody to be a traitor and a rebel totally outside the political order. So with these conditions in mind, let me begin. Let me, I, I begin with a, I don't know, maybe it's a simplistic question, but it's a basic one. Where, when, how, does freedom become freedom and slavery slavery? Despite the contentions of thinkers from Aristotle to Thomas Jefferson, the distinction between free and slave and the understanding of freedom are neither natural nor self-evident. They happen in history. So the question is, what history? In Rome, in Rome, freedom emerged in the change from a society with slaves to a slave society. Society with slaves and a slave society. These are two terms, they maybe flatten things out, but I think they're quite useful. By society with slaves, ancient historians refer to a society that has slaves, chattel slaves who are owned as property. And usually these chattel slaves don't exist in very large numbers, and they work alongside other kinds of dependent laborers who were not property. By slave society, historians referred to a society with many, many more slaves. But numbers, numbers are not the only issue. They are only part of the story. The location of slaves, the function of slaves in society is equally, actually more important than numbers. And in slave societies, Slaves aren't just decoration or domestic servants. They earn and produce the bulk of income of the wealthy and the elite. And usually this is in agriculture, at least in ancient society. Last but not least, in a slave society, slave, slavery is not simply an economic and social fact. It is a matter of culture, 
and a matter of ideology. The relation of master and slave in slave societies shapes the society's values, the society's attitudes, and its ways of seeing. So a little Roman history, buckle your seat belts because we're gonna go through many centuries, you know, really quickly. Early Republican Rome, we're talking about the fifth and fourth centuries BCE, was a society with slaves. The earliest Roman law, it's called the Law of the Twelve Tables, mentions chattel slaves, frequently slaves as property, and it distinguishes these slaves from the free in terms of treatment. Chattel slaves, slaves as property, are treated more harshly. Slaves were dependent laborers, but they were not the only dependent laborers. And they were not, in fact, the most important. It seems historians speculate that they were domestic slaves. It appears that there were actually certain circumstances in which the nexus faced the threat of sale into chattel slavery, that is, into becoming property. This is very confusing. But sale inside the society of Rome itself appears to have been an important distinction between the chattel slave and the nexus, the de debt bondsman, where slaves as property could be sold inside the society in Rome itself Debt bondsmen, who merited it, could only be sold into slavery, slavery trans Tiberim, across the Tiber, across the ancient boundary of the city. In effect, then, the chattel slave, as saleable property, and the Roman, that is a member of the community, were supposed to be mutually exclusive. There were supposed to be mutually exclusive categories at least in law. But, as you can well see, despite the d legal distinction, despite the legal distinctions between slave and free, debt bondage and also harsh treatment by the powerful, dogged poor free Romans and the powerless, and then in practice, in practice, in lived reality, in lived reality, debt bondage and harsh treatment narrowed the distance between slave and free. Not surprisingly, from the fifth through the third centuries, the underprivileged of Rome continuously agitated for protection against the powerful 
and the abolition of debt bondage. And they achieved it in 326. Writing some 200 years after the abolition of debt bondage in 326, Livy, he's writing at the end of the first century BCE, he recounts the events in what will, you will see is very Livian purple prose, recounts the events leading up to the abolition of debt bondage. His story is quite likely a legend or a fiction, but it is very informative about what Livy calls the beginning of freedom for the plebs. Note that freedom, freedom becomes not slavery. Here's Livy. Gaius Plubilius, this is like saying JQ pub, public, Gaius Plubilius had pledged his person to Lucius Papirius for a debt which his father had contracted. The youth and beauty of the debtor which ought to have called forth feelings of compassion only acted as incentives to lust and insult. Finding that his infamous proposals only filled the youth with horror and loathing, the man reminded him, reminded him that he was absolutely in his power and ought to terrify him and sought to terrify him by threats. As these failed to crush the boy's noble instincts, he ordered him, the, the creditor, ordered him to be stripped and beaten. So the battered boy runs into the street. How exactly he does this, and Livy is not always so clear, but he runs into the street. He draws a crowd. The crowd forms. They rush the Senate, and they demand the abolition of debt slavery, which presto changeo happens. <laughs> Sorry, if only this could happen here. Anyway, friction or fact, fiction or fact, the story dramatizes the problem of the lack of a clear boundary between slave and free. The lack of a boundary is a problem in the fifth and fourth century. First, first, the movement of a free Roman is constrained by another. Second, he is treated as if he is physically and sexually vulnerable to whatever the person with power, whatever the person with power can extract by the use of force. Third, since the Romans associated honor with physical integrity, the boy, the freeborn boy, is robbed of the honor that should belong to him as a member of the Roman community. In Livy's recounting, a free boy is treated like a chattel slave, and the blurred line between slave and free is intolerable. In effect, Livy assumes that constraint, physical vulnerability, and lack of honor belonged to the slave, not the free member of Roman society or what we would call a citizen. To put this another way, in Roman history and historiography, slavery defined freedom, not freedom, slavery. And this continued. This continued as a society with slaves became a slave society. After the abolition of debt slavery in 326 and over a period of about a century, chattel slaves replace debt bondsmen as the main form of dependent labor in any productive unit in Rome larger than the family. Property, slaves as property, repl replace debt bondsmen. Rome's ever-expanding wars supplied these slaves. The Romans defeated an enemy. They made the enemy defeated enemy's captives, and the captives were sold into slavery. It's interesting. Earlier in their wars in Italy, before 326, the Romans would enslave some of the defeated, some of the conquered. But the enslavement of large numbers of enemies, of defeated enemies, 
enemies began only in the late fourth and early third centuries. Large scale enslavements, in other words, begin only around the time that the elite lost free debtors as its primary source of dependent labor. L let me just tell you it's all more complex, but th this is a major point. The Roman conquest of the Mediterranean in the second and first centuries BCE escalated the number of captives sold into slavery. Um, the Romans didn't always enslave the conquered, but, but it's important to know that conquest remained an important source of slaves, adding to the number of people enslaved in other ways, by piracy, by the slave trade, by being born a slave, by parents who um, abandon their children, by parents who are impoverished, who actually sell their own children. By the late first century BCE, in Roman Italy, the heartland of empire, Slaves from all these different sources number one to one and a half million people out of a population of five to six million. So we're talking about a population, they, they compose 20 to 30 percent of the population. They are noticeable. The labor of these slaves, very importantly, produced most of the income of the wealthy by working on their farms and their estates. And lastly, and I'll come to this at the end of the lecture, lastly, by the late first century BCE, chattel slavery shaped Roman understandings of the self, of social relations, of, and of power. Numbers, labor, and what I'm going to call thinking with slaves. In other words, by the late first century BCE, Rome had become a slave society. What I'd like to do now is to take a quick look at the conditions of slaves shaped by this development, because it allows us to see what slavery at Rome was and to see what freedom was not. All right, most important, most fundamental, slaves were property. Slaves were owned. Important because as property, slaves could be used in different ways. A slave was an item for sale. A slave could be the, replace, the repayment of a loan. A slave could be collateral for a loan, a gift, a legacy, something that you could mortgage. Ultimately, and this is to use the modern term, the slave was, whoops, what happened here? Oh. The slave was fungible, exchangeable, replaceable, substitute, substitutable. Like cash, the slave as property could be turned to any use. Uh, I use an example from the Roman poet Marshall written in the late first century CE. He makes the point, I think, quite clearly sarcastically and nastily. You sold a slave yesterday for 1,200 sesterces Calliodorus that you might dine well once. You have not dined well. The four pound mullet which you bought was the ornament and chief dish of your dinner. A man may cry, that's not a fish. Not a fish, you prolificate. It's a man. A man, Calliodorus, is what you eat. Marshall's imaginary character, Calliodorus, turns a slave into cash, the cash into a fish, and the fish into a single fancy pants dinner. In other words, the human being becomes a fish, becomes a dinner. This way of seeing, lest you think it's, whoops, Poetic, lest you think it's literary decoration or rhetorical trope, this way of seeing belonged to Roman common sense. I'm going to use a letter of Cicero's as an example, and it could be repeated many times over. Cicero writes to his friend Atticus, 
He has won a small victory during his governorship in Cilicia. The date is 19 December 51 BCE. And he tells his friend that he's divided up the plunder and then he intends to sell all the captives. As I write, Cicero tells Atticus, as I write, there is about 120,000 sesterces on the platform, on the catasta, the platform for the sale of slaves. Cicero's words well express the fungibility of the human soul. Cicero doesn't even count the captives that he puts up for sale. For him, they're not solutions, not captives, not even men and women. They are just 120,000 sesterces. Actually, maybe we should say that they're solutions, captives, men and women, and 120,000 sesterces. Anyway, the slave is fungible. Property does one more thing. It measured the loss, the slaves' loss, slaves' losses over their own persons. The condition of slaves as property meant that slaves had no legal rights. They could not set the law in motion on their own behalf. And slaves, in their own right, did not suffer what Roman law called injury or insult, inuria in Latin. Inuria was the citizen's ability to sue for verbal and physical aggression, either to himself or his family. In other words, the suit for injury allowed the citizen, allowed the freeborn Roman to defend his honor. In principle, in law, in practice, slaves had no physical integrity. They had no sexual integrity. They could be flogged, whipped, slapped, beaten, tortured, used and abused sexually, and I could continue with the list. The material remains of chains, shackles, and fetters testify to the violent restriction of slave bodies, of fugitives and troublesome slaves, as we can see in these shackled bones of a slave chained in an underground chamber in a villa near Pompeii and left to die in the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 CE. Slaves, this is my, remember these are people slide. Slaves' vulnerability with respect to the state was made clear by the fact that they were subject to torture not only for crimes that they committed, but as witnesses. Slaves never testified. Slave testimony was never taken except under torture. The thinking was slaves didn't tell the truth, so you had to apply pain to extract the truth. And the jurists knew that this didn't work so well, but they continued to do it. I want to stress not only the slave is property, but also what M.I. Finley called the slave's deracination, the slave's uprootedness, pulled up by the roots. Uh, Finley means that the slave was cut off, separated from kin, separated from place, culture, and people. First kin and family. Legally and socially, slaves were considered kinless. Obviously, slaves had parents, they had siblings. Under certain conditions of their enslavement, they married, they had children. However, even when they had and lived in family relations, those relations existed as a privilege that was granted by the owner and which could be withdrawn unilaterally by him or her. And, and we should understand that these relations could always and were always threatened by sale. So kin deracination, kinless. Second, slaves were deracinated because they were always considered outsiders. Whether they were captured in a foreign war or whether they were born in Italy. The association between conquest and slavery shaped Roman perceptions of each and every slave as a defeated foreigner. 
And this condition was symbolized and it was actually enacted in a legal procedure for claiming property. In this legal procedure, it's actually a legal ritual, the plaintiff takes a rod and touches the thing that he is claiming with the rod, which represents a spear. A spear, you see, according to the jurist, is important because the Romans thought that the things that they had seized from the enemy, from the enemy, were lawfully theirs. So move backwards, conquest, spear, rod, claim. Now the person enslaved in war is, was not simply something captured from the enemy. He or she had been the enemy. So in court, in court, the legal ritual replaced the act of violent seizure and sale on the battlefield. The legal practice made every slave, war captive, homeborn, denizen of the marketplace, made every slave a conquered foreigner whose powerlessness had been manifest in his capture. In fact, the Romans recognized the slave's specific origin. The Roman term is natio, and for the moment, I'm just going to use it. Why? Because natio indicated a slave's potential use and his or her acquiescence to subjection. So here is the Roman, part of the Roman law on the sale of slaves. The Ro those who sell slaves must state the natio of each at the sale, for the natio of a slave frequently encourages or deters a prospective buyer. Hence it is advantageous to know his natio since it is reasonable to suppose that some slaves are good because they originate from a natio that has a good reputation, and others bad because they come from a natio that is rather disreputable. So natio here is not really origin, culture, or society. It is a, a measure of if you're going to be a good slave or a bad slave. The Latin term natio can be translated in many, many, many ways. Origin, people, tribe state, or race. Which noun a translator chooses will connote particular meanings for readers of ancient Roman texts in the 21st century, especially in the context of slavery. And this brings us to the question of Roman slavery and race and racism, that bundle of notions and practices that made skin color and physiognomy the visual signs of inferiority of character, culture, morals, and inferiority inherited by descendants. And then the other side is superiority inherited by descendants. Now, people acknowledge that slavery existed in other places than the United States. I should say, in the United States, people acknowledge that slavery existed in other places. But popular historical imagination, popular historical imagination, usually depends on the American experience and associates slavery with race, in particular with the millions of black Africans shipped to the Americas from the 17th century on. In effect, in popular imagination, slave is associated with black. Um, this assumption, by the way, behind it lies a whole complex history that um, is assumed here and needs to be unpacked. Roman slaves, however, did not belong to one race or natio, however you figure it. The Romans, if you will, were equal opportunity enslavers. They enslaved the conquered, whether they were Gauls or Britons or Greeks or Egyptians or Germans or Africans or, you know, a whole list of all kinds, all kinds of peoples and tribes. However, black Africans in the Roman Empire illustrate, I hope they will illustrate, the difference of experience and assumptions. There were Africans from sub-Saharan Africa in the empire, and some of them were, in fact, slaves. However, since they came not only as slaves, but as merchants and traders and mercenaries, travelers, we cannot assume 
a representation of an African is a black slave. Beware the equation African slave in Rome. It is also the case that the Romans, they, they weren't blind to skin color, but for them it was just not the most salient feature in the representation of people, even of slaves. And I hope this will be a case in point. This is a painting from the house of the Triclinium in Pompeii. This is a dinner party. Ooh. Ooh. There are, here's a guest, a guest, a guest, a guest, a guest, and there are four slaves. One, two, three. Oh, I'm sorry, this vomiting guy, he's a guest too. <laughs> in the front, three slaves in white tunics undertake domestic chores. They are working. This slave takes off the shoes of this guest. This slave hands a cup of wine to the guy in the green whatever it is. And this poor fellow holds up a guest who is vomiting. In the back, you have a figure in a green mantle. He's bald. And next to him is a black male, an adolescent, in a red sleeveless garment. You should know that it's supposed to be fancy pants garment. Our attention is immediately drawn to the boy's color. Oh, wow, a black slave. The Romans had black slaves. However, for Romans, color was only one element among several, and it, was, it is not the element that identifies him as a slave. Two things identify slaves in this representation as in others. One, domestic jobs, and two, sexual posture. Here, the boy, you can't, this painting is peeling off, peeling away. The boy sort of leans into and holds on to the man, is read, would be read by the Romans as a sexual gesture or posture. So the boy with the bald man is distinguished from other slaves not by color, but by the absence of a domestic task and by sexual gesture. And perhaps, as I suggested earlier, equally distinctive is dress, that fancy red garment worn by the boy, rather than the plain white tunics worn by the other slaves who have defined tasks. Roman depictions of non-Romans in general pay very little attention to the differences that figure so largely in modern notions of race. Tribal people, barbarians, they always have beards. They always have shaggy hair. They're always in need of seeing a barber. And yet, for the most, yeah, you can see it here. This is from the Arch of Septimius Severus. Shaggy beard, shaggy beard. More distinctive, even more distinctive, is the importance of clothing. For the most part, Romans represented difference in terms of clothing. Barbarians, they always wear trousers. Think about you in the audience. Trousers. Or they have particular outfits. This is from the uh, column of Trajan. Oops. These are um, uh, Dacians kneeling before Trajan. Right here, I, you can't see it very well, but they have these very distinctive hats and cloaks. And here is the trousers. Here are the trousers. Above all, when Romans represent non-Romans who became slaves, they usually focus on the captive's subjection, positions of subjection, rather than any physical features. Non-Romans, the soon-to-be slaves, appear in chains, Right there, I, you can, I don't know if you can see it here. See the chains? They appear in chains, they kneel in subjection, they slump in defeat, and they mourn or they glower as on the lower registrar star of this. This is a cameo, very famous cameo. So let me show you the close up. Here, kneel in subjection, their, uh, hit, hit, the conqueror is holding on to their hair. 
Here, a barbarian with his hands tied behind his back again, beard and messy hair, glowering at the Romans who are setting up a, uh, a, whoops, a trophy. Oop. And a woman sort of exhausted or resigned. The Romans had ethnic stereotypes, often very negative ones. But despite these stereotypes of origin and behavior, you know, Carthaginians are always treacherous, Greeks are always tricky, they go kind of like this. Despite these stereotypes of origin and behavior, the Romans lack the notions of race that developed in Europe and the Americas from the 15th to the 19th centuries, especially as you get into the 19th centuries century and you get this, you know, apparatus of biology and pseudo-scientific theory. Ancient historians, this is not surprising, why would the Romans have our notion of race or notions? Ancient historians, however, debate whether the Romans had their own notions of race, racism, or what some historians call proto-racism. But Roman slavery, Roman slavery, despite the outsider status of the slave, was not associated with race or even ethnicity. Or rather, we should say, it is not associated with any one race or ethnicity. Again, the Romans were equal opportunity enslavers. They trafficked in civilized people, in barbarians, in literate people, in illiterate people, regardless of any physical features. So the question raised by all this, I hope, is how and why does this slavery become racial? Not just an assumption that it does, and what are the implications? There's one more Roman practice that I think raises questions about slavery, freedom in the making of America. And that is what many historians call thinking with slaves. Using slavery as a model or as a metaphor, Roman authors borrowed the vocabulary of slavery, its practices, and slave owners' assumptions about slaves' experience to figure other forms of domination that were not a matter of slavery. So, for example, free men who give in to their own emotions their desires, their bodily appetites. These men become slaves, slaves to fear and ambition, greed, lust, gluttony, whatever it is they desire, if they cannot control themselves. In the Roman way of talking about this, they become slaves. In effect, they cannot act, so they become slaves to their particular desire, whatever it is. In the political realm, senators, described their tribulations under Republican dynasts like Julius Caesar and emperors like Nero in terms of the relations of masters and slaves. Dynasts and emperors, the Julius Caesars and the Neros become masters. Senators become slaves. Like slaves, Senators are not free to act and they are not free to speak because of forks or the threat of force holds them back. And sometimes the only freedom, the only way out was death, or so they thought. And there were many examples of Roman senators who chose suicide to living in slavery under a tyrant, but there was none none more famous than Marcus Porcius Cato, novelist, senator, politician. Cato, here, and Caesar, I mean, the facts are they were on opposite sides of the Civil War that broke out in 49. Caesar won, Cato was on the losing side, and he committed suicide in Utica in North Africa in 46 BCE. Later authors, here you have a late uh, 18th century painting of the suicide of Cato. Later authors depicted Cato as the incarnation of the Republic. This is not what he was when he committed suicide, it's what he became. 
for some senators, too, in the first century, who had troubles with emperors, Cato's suicide at Utica made him a martyr to liberty, a man who preferred slavery to death. And this takes us back to George Washington and to Valley Forge and to 11 May, 1778. All right, I'm going to take a few minutes to give you a conclusion. Why Valley Forge? Why 1778, 11 May? And then we'll go right into the Q&A. There is a microphone in the central aisle over there, and a microphone in the, my right hand and the far aisle here. If you have a question, I would be happy to answer them. But if you would, uh, and I want everybody else to hear your question, if you would go to the microphone, I'd appreciate it. Valley Forge, George Washington, 11 May, 1778. After the terrible, terrible winter, the terrible winter at Valley Forge, George Washington, or one of his officers, chose to celebrate by putting on a performance of Cato, a play, a tragedy by Joseph Addison. The tragedy recounts the last days of Cato in Utica, Cato's heroic and sacrificing behavior and his suicide. The play was first performed in 1713, and it was later wildly, wildly popular in the American colonies. It spoke especially to men who led the opposition to British imperialism. These prosperous, educated, and successful men saw themselves as threatened with enslavement. The Stamp Act, British policies, produced widespread claims that the colonists had been, in their words, reduced to the greatest slavery and bondage, to perpetual slavery, to unmerited slavery, to ignominious slavery. In this environment, Cato's, Addison's Cato was read as a model. Cato exercises discipline over his emotions in the play. He sacrifices his personal concerns while the republic is in danger. And above all, he is willing to die for freedom. The hand of fate is over us, he tells a young man in act two, and heaven exacts severity from all our thoughts. It is now a time to talk aught but chains or conquest, liberty or death. George Washington, in fact, shared these sentiments. The time is now at hand, he wrote in July of 1776, which must probably determine whether Americans are to be free men or slaves. Our cruel and unrelenting enemy leaves us no choice but brave resistance or the most adject, abject submission. Cato, Addison's Cato, was a favorite of George Washington's. He admired the disciplined, principled behavior of its hero. He alluded to the play, he quoted the play, and traditional accounts of its performance at Valley Forge, see Washington's hand at work here. Historians see it, and this is a, a traditional interpretation, see the play, putting on this play, the performance of the play at Valley Forge, as a celebration, says one historian, a celebration of Republican and patriotic virtue at the conclusion of the Valley Forge winter, a gift from Washington and his elite commanders to the weary men. Now, in truth, there is some debate 
exactly about where there's some debate about the exact circumstances and who was in the audience and where it was performed. But everyone agrees that Washington was there and many of his officers were there. And what he and his men saw was the use of slavery as metaphor. By way of conclusion, I want to return to the Roman case to raise questions about this American thinking with slaves. So let me return you to Rome. When a Roman senator addicted to food or drink or luxury is likened to a slave, what counts, we should understand, is the mind and soul of the senator, not the social reality of the slave whose inability to assert his will is not simply a matter of his own free choice, but ultimately a matter of his owner's force. Likening the emperor to a slave owner and a senator to a slave is very compelling, very compelling. It dramatizes the loss of power of the senator in a new political order. But it too, this use of metaphor, slaves as metaphor, drains the realities of the slave of meaning. This practice, this metaphorical practice, forgets that in reality the men we are talking about as slaves stood at the top of the social hierarchy, deferred to by lesser men. These men we are, who call themselves slaves or see themselves as slaves owned vast acres, and they themselves commanded and ordered many slaves of all kinds. The senator... The senator was never really a slave. That was his tragedy. He feels or he felt that he was treated like a slave and that he, that he is treated like a slave, not that a slave is treated like a slave, that he is treated like a slave is a devastating, devastating critique of a political system, of the dynast rule or the emperor's rule. In this way, metaphorical practice diminishes the condition of the slave suffering social deprivation, physical violence, and the loss of kin. In effect, by identifying with the imagined subjectivity and condition of the slave, upper class readers, upper class readers of these texts could experience their own compulsions and they could criticize the political order. In doing so, we might say that they consumed the slave's subjectivity. So maybe with thinking with slaves, we should rewrite Marshall's poetic lines. A man may cry, this is not a fish, not a fish, it is a man, a man, Calliodorus, is what you eat. A man may cry, this is not a slave, not a slave. It's a human, a human senator is what you eat. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> oh, good. No questions? Oh, no, 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 no. What? I wonder if I could bring you to today's uh, political situation and ask you if uh, folks. Uh, who see themselves as enslaved by Washington, D.C., uh, as the government uh, oppressing them has a parallel to the way uh, George Washington and his folks saw themselves then, and whether that is, again, a similar type of uh, 
analogy or poor analogy to slavery? Uh, I, I want to you know, be very careful not, beside my comments about current politics. But I think any, any metaphorical use of slaves by those who in many ways have certain freedoms and privileges, that, it ought, that that use of slaves is a consumption of the slave. It, it, to me, it's a kind of forgetting about not only history, but the world we live in. There are, as I think many people know, there are more people enslaved today than there ever wa were in the Roman Empire. You know, sex slaves, children, childhood labor. So to use that metaphor, it seems to me, yes, is, um, is the way Washington and the colonists and the ways these privileged upper class Romans, they, they, they found a way, you know, it's another sort of aspect of fungibility. You can use the slave to any purpose, even a metaphorical one. I don't know, does that answer your question? If I uh, followed uh, you correctly, the uh, uh, Roman sl uh, condition of slavery would, could only ever be inherited uh, for one generation. Um, and debt, uh, debt bondage also could only be inherited for one generation. So the son could assume the, uh, the um, debt obligation um, of, of his father, but it wouldn't go to a grandson. Are we talking about debt slavery? Um, well, you tell me. And uh, okay. uh, was there a difference in these different groups? Oh. What I'm getting right. at, though, is is that this this was in stark contrast, if I do understand that correctly, in stark contrast to the codified American slave law, which um, kept the condition of slavery for an infinite number of generations, and it would be uh, matrilineally descended. Um, Romans didn't do anything like that. They no, th they did. They in did. Fact. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for chattel slaves, if we're talking about slaves as property, let's leave aside Nexi, debt bondsmen. Roman slaves, chattel slaves, the Roman um, slaves followed the condition of their mother regardless of the legal status of the father. So if your mother was a slave, you are too. Your father could be emperor, it didn't matter. If your mother was a slave, so were you. So the condition of slavery could continue generation after generation after generation, with one exception. The Romans, and there is a, some debate about this, the Romans seem to have manumitted a large number of slaves, and, and we should say slaves in certain positions. We, the evidence of tombstones indicates that slavery, there was one way that slavery ended, and that was manumission. And it seems to have been taken three or four generations for the manumitted slave, for the, the, the family of the manumitted slave to, to pass into the society at large. Now, debt bondsmen, oh boy, that's a can of worms to tell you that that's a real historical judgment. I, there's a lot of debate over exactly what debt bondsmen, whether it continued, the son could inherit it, but it's not clear to me, and I think it's not clear to many scholars, if that was then inherited by the son of the son. But the debt bondsman could always be reproduced by the extension of a new, if you will, loan. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, in ancient Rome, would slaves run away? Was it common to have slaves run away and or have sort of slave revolts? And when the slaves ran away, how were they identified as being slaves, if not by race? Okay, did everybody hear the question? Yes, there, is, uh, there was an extensive fugitive slave law, which suggests it was a major problem. There were slave catchers, we know from the legal materials that uh, the owners of escaped slaves
the difficulty, they're, 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 the difficulty of running away were considerable. The literary sources suggest when it was successful, slaves hidden in the larger cities. But there was a whole apparatus for uh, ca capturing escaped slaves. Slave revolts. There were three major slave revolts in Rome in the period, in the period from 104 to 70. The last one was the famous Spartacus revolt. Interestingly, they come, seem to come every generation, about every 30 years, 104, and then um, 30 years later, and then Spartacus. After Spartacus, there doesn't seem to have been any other major slave revolt. But that revolt was put down in a really quite horrifying way. Crassus, who finally um, it took quite a lot to uh, beat Spartacus in a military battle. Uh, once the battle was won, he, uh, on the road from Rome south to Capua, about every couple, a couple hundred meters was a crucified slave. So he lined this major road from Rome to another major town with crucified slaves. And there was, as a sort of example and a sort of, I think, horror story that was handed down, there wasn't after that any other slave revolts, major slave revolts. Thank you so much. Did I cover everything? Yeah. yeah. Good. The stereotype of American slavery that we're always presented with is plantation slavery. And I know it was much more complex than that. Um, in reading the book about Spartacus, you get the impression that a lot of the Roman slavery was plantation slavery, and slaves were kept away from Rome on plantations owned by rich people. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, there were many slaves working on the estates of the rich. So I, I, I'm wary of this word plantation. Um, working and, and, but working on farms, some of which, Roman estates were sometimes several smaller farms put together. Working on, in, as herdsmen, as the planters in fields, in viticulture, in oil culture, especially in, in the production of marketable goods like wine and oil, large-scale production. There are quite a lot of slaves involved in what you're calling plantation, in, uh, in outside of Rome, in uh, various areas of Italy, and it depends on where it is, what they were doing. However, there are many, many slaves that are domestic servants. Rome was the capital uh, of a, you know, at one point the population in the early first century CE is a million people. Every senator and aristocrat has an establishment there, and you were supposed to live in a certain way, and that required a retinue of slaves. We know that the prefect of the city in 62 <coughs> CE, I think it's 62, had 400 slaves living in his establishment as domestic slaves. So on the land, domestic servants, and then, and then, the, and the evidence is mostly from tombstones, you find many slaves working at a sort of lower level of the society. So you have a, uh, a smith or a shoemaker who himself has a slave and manumits that slave. There's a whole other layer of Roman slavery that really I, I, I've not addressed, um, where you have um, people who seem to have been of slave origin themselves, or there we can actually identify them as freed slaves, as freedmen, freed women, and they themselves then manumit free slaves that were in their workshops. So there's at this lower level where, in, in fact, slave and free, there's a, probably a lot of mixture. You have that level of slavery that's quite, as far as we can tell, quite extensive. Good evening. Thank you uh, for the lecture. And 
I'm not quite sure how to phrase this so it doesn't come out quite right, forgive me. But I wanted to talk about both Cato and Washington point of fears. The point of what? Fear. So they're comparing themselves to becoming potential subjects and slaves. And it isn't out of th thin air that they're doing this. They have an intellectual justification for doing this. In the case of Cato, it's the Roman fear of the kingship and the return of the kingship. And so anyone in the old, their perception of in the old order before their, the establishment of the republic, everyone was a slave to the king. And so there's that basis. And in Washington and the southern and the slave owners in the states, there was the impact of Sullivan versus the crown, where whether it was in fact real or not, they perceived a direct threat that the crown would eventually ban slavery entirely. And therefore they would be subject to losing all their wealth and property. And therefore they themselves be made much less wealthy, much less powerful because they would lose their slaves. So it, the rhetoric is rhetoric and I understand that it's rhetoric, but both of them had at least an intellectual foundation for the fears and they codified it in the terminology of the time because they didn't have Marx or Engels to quote because <laughs> Marx or Engels hadn't existed yet. So, so the question is, is I, I understand your premise, but I'm not, I think that there's justification for them using that rhetoric of the time is what I'm, asking, I'm saying. Yeah, okay. Um, this is a very, very complicated question. They do feel, you know, both the Cato's, Cato and senators living under emperors feel quite rightly endangered. Their position is endangered, their, their role in society, and certainly for senators, their political power really was gone, right? Um, and in the colonies, this threat, you know, the perceived threat that they will be in some ways reduced but that's exactly my point. In a slave society, in a slave society, one of the uses of slaves is to think with slaves, is to think that your losses, your losses you imagine to be in terms of slavery. But you must imagine then a subjectivity of the slave. You yourself become feel like a slave, but that subjectivity held by somebody, you know, let's take John Dickinson, right, was uh, the um, largest slaveholder in Philadelphia at some point, who had this syllogism, um, those who are taxed without representation are slaves, we are taxed without representation, therefore we are slaves, right? I mean, he th is thinking, he is thinking in terms of a slave society because he's living in a slave society, but he imagines, he imagines the subjectivity and the place of the slave. But it isn't the slave, right? There, there is a whole other, my point is simply that there is a whole other reality out there and that this is another use of slaves as much as using a, selling a slave, mortgaging a slave, turning a slave into cash, you turn the slave into your own experience. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. They felt endangered, and this is uh, how they thought about it. And that is, the, in fact, the marker of a slave society, that, it, that, that slavery has ideological and cultural repercussions. You know what I'm answering? Yes, they felt endangered, absolutely. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, wonderful lecture, by the way. Thank you for that. But uh, the question I have is, in the social ladder of the Roman Empire, was there a uh, sort of explicit difference between slave and gladiator, or were they mm -hmm. sort of the two different names for the same people? Some gladiators were slaves, not all gladiators were slaves. Uh, there were training schools for gladiators, um, that would buy slaves. I don't think Russell Crowe, is it Russell Crowe, gladiator? Uh, who, are, who are trained as gladiators. Some gladiators then as slaves achieve their freedom, 
the thing about gladiators along gladiators are along with gladiator trainers, prostitutes, pimps, and actors <laughs> all have the status of uh, of being what the Romans called it infamous. You are a discredited person. You, you really can't work this legal system as an infamous. Um, and so gladiators, regardless of their status, belong in this particular category. But the short answer to your question is some gladiators were slaves and, and some were not. And they could achieve their freedom. Hi. Hi. My name is Megan Wilbert, and um, I'm really interested in how um, you know, well, well-intentioned, good-meaning people can allow a system like slavery to continue, and um, I'm wondering whether that comparison, um, people using that comparison to ancient Rome, was partly, you know, a way to really justify that system. And um, so I'm just curious about whether you see evidence of that kind of cognitive dissonance of seeing people seeing themselves as good Christian, you know, well-meaning people, and yet you know, um, committing these atrocities and whether you see this, um, this comparison being part of that. And then also, you kind of alluded to this, but um, didn't come right out and say it. And so I'm just wondering whether um, you feel like that's a fair comparison or not, particularly since our um, system was, was racialized. Um, that's what I think is interesting about Rome as a sort of example in that you're dealing with a society in which there are many good people, right? There are many good people. They, they are, they're generous, they help each other. Maybe they're not Christians, but you know, they, they, you can say they're good people, but at the same time, they did not see slavery. I, this is very hard for us, you know, sort of post-abolitionism. They did not see slavery as wrong. Now, it's, I, I, you were right to raise this question of when, once you get into a, a society and a period when slavery becomes a wrong, then you have a different, um, I hate to use this word tonight, but a different ball game. You have a different, you have a, a, a different situation, which I am going to leave to my colleagues. Um, <laughs> who are my colleagues Stephanie Smallwood and Stephanie Camp, who I believe will really speak to this particular question. But uh, um, it, it is, in fact, the case that being good and um, participating in slavery are not mutually exclusive, as terrible as that might seem to us. So, uh, as I understand your premise, um, sl freedom is defined as not being a slave in Roman society. Now, in Roman history. In Roman history, right. Um, now, it seems that in the American ideal that there's more a positive aspect associated with that. In other words, you're not free because you're not a slave, but it's more that you're a citizen because you belong to a certain character or class of individuals, namely a landed male. And those landed males are the ones that comprise the citizenship, citizenship and the leaders of the democracy, right? So it's not, it's more of a positive aspect as opposed to a negative. So if you think about the Jeffersonian ideal, the Jeffersonian ideal is a, a, a whole nation that's full of landed citizens, you know, and that's the ideal. So this whole question, there's a difference there that I think is important. Now the other, and, and along with that same question is, is it comes back to the question I want to ask you is, if that's the ideal of the American citizen and the basis of the republic, wouldn't that be similar to what the ideals were in say England at the time, where you know they'd also be studying Cato, you know they would have you know you know estates. They wouldn't have slaves, but they'd have servants which were more or less indentured to the land. They would not be able to leave. And yet I would think they'd also be fondly quoting Cato. Have you, have you looked into that type of uh, you know, comparison? For Between 
between the way, uh, the way uh, Washington thought of Rome and you know, Roman you know, literature and the way, say, for example, the aristocracy in England thought of the Roman literature. Are they similar or are they different? Well, I, I think it's the colonial, well, yeah, they're similar and different. I mean, that's a kind of cop out on my part. Are they more similar <laughs> than they are different, um, I think, is the but, question. But the, the play read differently in England, and if you're going to ask me about early 18th century English politics, I'm going to abdicate. Um, it, it read differently in, in England in the early 18th century than it did in the colonies in the 1760s and 70s. Right? The play got a different sort of reading in the American context. So what was, so what was, the, reading, what was the reading in England, though? So, I mean, I, 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 I'm sorry. What was, what was the reading, the reading in, in England? I, 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 I don't know. OK. All right. I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm, I, I don't know anything about, sorry, about okay. British Thank politics you. in the early 18th century. But I bet there's someone he, here who does. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I have the sense that the African and the American colonists wanted to be, they would say they wanted to be patricians and they wanted to enlighten the subjugated peoples on an intimate level. So I was wondering, did the actual Roman slaveholders see themselves as benefactors to their slaves? Like, did they try to be seen by their slaves as parents or friends? Or did they try to socialize with their slaves? Or did they teach their slaves literature? Okay, that, it's a very complicated question because there's a history to the practice of mastery. So if you start in the second century and you look at the Cato I'm talking about, his great, 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 da, 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 great grandfather, um, how he traded his slaves, and he wrote this manual on it. He, he's, he's very little interested in kindness, in, e even in a sort of psychological mastery. Right? As, you, as slavery develops over the course of, from the second century BCE through the first century, B, uh, first century CE, what you see is the development of paternalism. Right? This, this, this sense that the master is a benevolent father who feeds and clothes his slaves and takes care of them. You get uh, with, say, Seneca, who is, was the tutor of Nero, writes about how you shouldn't be afraid to have dinner with your slaves. You know, everybody's a slave to something, so you should treat your slaves, you know, with kindness. And um, but, and, and you get a lot, a lot of this that the master wants to be a kindly father, and that he himself is. Um, is, is the agent, right? He takes care of his slaves. Not that his slaves take care of him, right? That he is dependent on his slaves for the person who cooks his dinner, you know, washes his clothes, cleans his house, and half a dozen other tasks. There's no sense of the master's dependence on the slave. There's no sense that for a mucky muck of society, he needs servants, right? There's no, it's, it's the other way around. It's that, you know, as a benevolent parent, you take care, the ma Roman master takes care of his slaves. Um, if we're talking about the top of society and we're talking about a Seneca, who's vastly wealthy, many estates, lots of slaves, a senator, or an aristocrat, there is a huge social gap between, say, the senator and his bedroom servant. Not that they couldn't be intimate or that they couldn't be friendly, but these sorts of relationships are often one-sided, right? Um, it's the master may feel affection for the slave and assume that the slave feels affection for him, but after all, what the slave is spending his or her time doing is waiting on the master. Y you have a very complicated, a complicated sort of scenario. At the lower level of society, which I was talking about before, whether you have these craftsmen, shoemakers, whatever, who themselves have slaves, it may be that there is a different sort of relationship, a more familial relationship, between a slaveholder who is himself an ex-slave 
and a slave in the same trade that Emmanuel. The evidence for this is tombstones, and it's very tricky. But does that answer your question? Thank you very much.